We'll do all those things of God. Good morning, everyone. No need running, Brenda. No need running. <laughs> Slow it down. Well, once again, the Lord has blessed each and every one of us by giving us once again another opportunity to set foot inside these walls that we together may go over and see what thus saith this lesson this morning. So with those words being said, as Rose and Alonzo have led us by standing to their feet, we ask that we all may stand and we'll have a word of prayer. And we're going to see how this lesson is going to transpire here this morning. So shall we pray? Fathers, once again, upon this hour and upon this day, as already stated, dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to go from yet one Sunday to the next, a time in which we can come together as one to go over what thus saith this your word. And as always, Father, as we go over this word, we ask that you would guide us, that you would direct us, that you would give us maybe a portion of wisdom that we all might be able to understand this lesson, maybe in a way that we haven't seen it before and learned something from it, and that we may not only use it for our own benefit, but may we truly share it with others. We ask right now blessings upon those that are here and those that still may be traveling on their way. But truly upon this, I would be with those, for whatever reason it was, could not be here today. But we are ever so thankful that we serve an omnipresent God, that you are in all places yet at all times. And now, Father, as we go into this lesson, we ask that you may make teaching easy, that the words may flow, dear Lord, and that we all leave here with more than what we came in in our level of knowledge and understanding of your word. For it's in Jesus' name that we give this prayer. Amen, amen. <clears throat> well, as always, good morning to you all, and I hope you had a good week and looking forward to another wonderful time in this class session. Today, we are in the third lesson of unit number two, which deals with Daniel's faithful prophetic ministry. Today's lesson, we're dealing with a subject matter that is essential in the life of the Christian, and that is this thing we call prayer. And when you look at prayer, you'll find that we have prayer throughout, shall we say, our studies throughout the Bible, throughout our day. Uh, we have a scripture that says the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. There's one that says that whatever thing we're asking in prayer, believing, we shall receive. And then there's one that says, ask, and it shall be given. Seek, you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. And then it says, for whosoever asks shall receive. And whosoever seeketh shall surely find, and he that knocketh it shall be opened unto them. There's a song that Helen always liked to sing in this, Helen. It says, it's me, it's me, O Lord, standing, what? In the need of prayer. But I like the next part. It says, it's not who? Not my mother, not my father. But they come back and say, but it's me, O Lord, that's standing in need of prayer. So in the life of a Christian, we have to understand what prayer is. And you'll find that people look at prayer and really differently. Prayer is basically your communication, or you could say your talk with who? With God. That would be it's your communication, it's your talk with God, and how you talk with God. <clears throat> I've always chuckled, and I shouldn't, but I do, at when you're in the church setting and people pray, or they're called forth to pray, you ever notice how some people change up completely? What I mean by that is, to me, and I'm not beating them up, but I, I don't check they, not themselves. Otherwise, they'll pray in a King James. Lord, thus do it. No, talk like you normally would talk. Because what it is, it, it's your, your, not your, your, it's your communication with God and how you talk with God. And we being made in God's image, sometimes God just want to hear from his children. We all have to hear from some folks when they call you up and just say, I'm just calling to see how you're doing. I'm just calling to know that, hey, so-and-so got a cookout, and you're invited, and come on, ride with me, and I'm just calling to see what's going on today, and so on. You like those kind of calls. And God desires that I would say the same exact thing, just for people that sometimes just say, I'm just going to give prayer. But then you find that some folks have a different outlook on prayer. They call prayer, they don't use it as their talk with God. They use prayer as their petition to God. And what I mean by petition to God is that each and every time they call upon God, they call upon them with petition because they want something. They need something. In other words, they want something to be answered. You see it all the time. In other words, you've made God, now I call it your personal genie. In other words, I need something. I need for him to answer this wish. But sometimes, guess what? Be careful because God going to answer that prayer. But God answers prayer primarily in how many ways? It's three ways. Anybody know how he answers prayer? 
You have yes, no, and what's, what's the other one? Wait. There you go. What are the examples of that? What do you mean when God says, you pray to God for something, and you're looking for an answer? And God says yes to some things, no to some, and some wait. Got any examples of that? What, 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 what do we mean by that? How about that? In other words, as, let's start with the first one. You, you said yes to the first one because you need it. And God knows what you are in need of. And you pray to God about it. God knows you. You know God. And he understands you. And God said, guess what? Yes, Helen, I'm going to give it to you because you are deserving of it. Then there are times when no comes about. When does a no come into place? That's the biggest one. That's the best one. Sometimes, guess what? You're not ready for it. And God says, guess what? It is not for you. So here he says, guess what? No. Now, you might think you're ready for it. As a child, you'll ask for something, they won't give it to you. Your first response is, well, why you won't give it to me? Keep in mind, you asked for it, so now I'll give you a reply. Be ready for that reply. And it's basically, no, it is not for you. And what about the wait part? It's coming. Mm -hmm. But why do you have to wait? Why can't I have it now? You, but basically, you work it out, you can't handle it. It's not for you at this time. God said, I desire for you to have it, but you're not ready for it yet. And you've seen cases where people want certain things, but they're not ready for it yet. I'll give an example in finances. You'll see in many cases, one example is someone might leave somebody some money, but they say that child can have this money. So I know Royale can't have that money until she come up this age. Because you give it to her now, oh, Lord, it's gone. Guess why? Because you're not ready for it yet. So God's saying yes to it, but you got to wait on it. So that's how he answers prayer. But you'll find people make that petition. They want God to answer it right then and there. And all they come to God about is what they desire to have. And sometimes you just have to pray just to communicate with God. Not always looking and seeking to, shall we say, receive something from it. But oftentimes in the order of prayer, you'll find that we put these petitions one after another. And we all are made in his image. I guarantee you right now, I'm going to go on a limb. Everybody here got a cell phone? Everybody has a cell phone. I bet you dinner this evening. I'll take you all out to dinner. I guarantee you right now, each and every one of you, if I'm wrong, okay? Like I told you, the book Charles Barkley had, Charles Barkley, I may be wrong, but I doubt it. And here's my question to you. Just like there are those who call upon God when they want something. I guarantee you, everybody in here has a phone, one, at least one phone number in your cell phone that there's somebody that calls you and you go, Wallace, oh, I'm not answering that. I guarantee you there's at least one phone number that you will get and you will say, oh, no. I got one. I can tell you now, it was a time when each time I receive it, and as I stand in this church, when I look at that thing, son, I said, that's $120 right there. I'm not answering this phone. Because <laughs> every time, it always was somewhere around that number, this is what they need. And the only time they call, when they need something. Never call, hey, Kenny, how you doing? Just checking on you. Nope, nope, nope. It's, I need something. But that's how sometimes folks will look at prayer. But then there's another way of prayer. Another thing about prayer is called that intercessory prayer. Anybody know what intercessory prayer is? Yeah. yeah. What we say, praying for someone else. That's that intercessory prayer when you pray on the behalf of someone else. And we all are in need of that. Mm -hmm. I think Wallace, you had said years ago, sometimes, guess what? Do you think somebody prayed for us? Because we enough sense pray for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the intercessory prayer can be for anyone, even for, guess what? The unsaved. The unsaved don't even know God, but you say, Lord, if not for them, for me. I'm praying for this individual you may watch out for, over them. And God, you, you'll find answers that intercessory prayer. You might have someone who's uh, in an unconscious state in the hospital. Guess what? You say, well, I'm going to pray for them on their behalf. Another wonderful thing about intercessory prayer is that you don't even have to know that individual. You know, you'll be in a church you know, or any setting, they say, call out a name. And the name is called, you go, I don't know who that is. Mm -hmm. 
You don't have to even know the person, but guess what? You still can pray for them. And this is what our lesson deals with today. Another word you can use is what we have in our title of our lesson. It's titled, Daniel intercedes for who? For Israel. And intercessory prayer is just that you are interceding. So you could change this title, Jimmy, to basically say Daniel intercessory prayer, guess what? For Israel. He is praying now on Israel's behalf because guess what? Israel don't have enough sense to pray for themselves. Even after all they've been through, all they've seen, they do not have enough sense to do that. Today, folks, if you're using the Bible, or we still have some books if you need a book, but today's lesson is coming out of Daniel, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 4. Always bring your Sunday school book. Now, this one, that might slip by us because things have changed since COVID a little bit. Do everybody also bring a Bible or have access to a Bible? It's always good to bring that. You know, that's like a police officer going on the job without his weapon. That's like the fireman going to the fire and don't have water in the truck. You always got to have your weapon with you. But here you'll find that we're coming out of Daniel, the ninth chapter, starting at verse 4. And I said last week in closing that it's good to read these series of lessons because the writer pretty much has followed, you remember a chronological order I brought up? Because you'll find, I think our first lesson dealt with maybe chapter 1, then they went to chapter 3, then it might have been like chapter 7, 8, and then we're in chapter 9. You might, you might have skipped one or two, but if you read along, you'll be up to date. But a small point, which is always important because nothing is put in the Bible for filler. It's put there for a reason. Another small point I want to bring up is this, is that the chapters <clears throat> you'll find that as far as the lesson goes was given to us in a chronological order, but not always the Bible is in a chronological order completely. For example, we have how many books in the Bible? 66 books in the Bible. Are they in a chronological order? You'll find they're not. If you look at the dates of when they were written and what time frames, I don't like to use the term all over the place, but they are. They jump around. And the books of prophecy, oh, they really get tricky. The books of prophecy, they really jump around. And even in the actual book itself, the chapters are not even in order. Give example, um, Revelations. If you were to read Revelation, which is, can be a difficult book with all this uh, symbolism and so on, Revelations you'll find, you'll have like, mm, I might be off by a chapter or two, but i give you an example. You have chapters 1, 2, and 3. Then if you want to stay in line with that, read 9, 10, and 11. When you read that, come back and read 4, 5, and 6. They jump around, so they're not in a chronological order, which makes you study. The book of Daniel is one of the books of prophecy also. We just talked about how our chapters and the book is laid out in a chronological order. In this particular lesson, you'll find that the chapters are not in a chronological order. The writer jumps around. The way you tell this is, remember we talked about dates? We said dates in the Bible are given to us primarily how? How do we get dates in the Bible? Because normally they don't say July the 5th and August this or whatever. How do we know the time frames? What do the BCs? Hmm. There we go. See, to get those days, GG, you got to look at, as Sandra's mentioned, kings. Who reigned at that time? Who was the world power? Who existed and so on? Then you get a better idea. Okay, this one reigned during this period and so on from there. But a small point, which is an important point I want to show you is, if you were looking at a Bible, and let's say you're looking at Daniel, I'm going to start at Daniel, which chapter is the best one to use here? Chapter 4. I'm going to go through a couple chapters here, but I'm only using the first verse. It's just to show you something. Sandra hit the nail on the head when she mentioned about who reigned and who was king. That's one of the primary ways. But in chapter 4, it says this. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the peoples, nation, and men of every language who live in all the world, may ye prosper greatly. Who was the king? Nebuchadnezzar. He was a king of what nation? You can say of all nations, but they fell under a name that he was from. King Nebuchadnezzar was a king of what nation? The Babylonian Empire. That's who reigns at this time in the book of Daniel is the Babylonian Empire under King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, if you go by chapter 4, you go to chapter 5. The very first there. Now, chapter 5 says, King Belshazzar, 
gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. Another king, right? This is the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar has now died, and his king now reigns in his stead. And reigns over what nation? The Babylonian Empire. See, you got to follow people, places, and who was in power. The Babylonian Empire. So we got, remember these things now. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, correct? He died. His son, Belshazzar, now reigns over the nation of the Babylonians. Well, you go to chapter 6. Chapter 6, very first verse. I know I'm, I'm going a little fast. I, got to, got to, I can just click button instead of turning pages. hope I'm not going too quick for you. But in chapter 6, it says, It pleased who? Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule. Oops, let me, I've got another translation here. Let me turn back to my King James, which I, I typically use. It said, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom. So now you have another king after Belshazzar named Darius. Now, it doesn't mention it right here, but this is a king over the Medes. Remember they had the, the Medo Persian Empire? And last week we talked about the ram, had a little horn, and then one of his horns was big. The big horn was the Persian, the small one was the Medes, which came the Medo Persian Empire. But now you don't have the Persian king, but it is the Median king named Darius who reigns over the kingdom. And he reigns over what kingdom? The Babylonian Empire. Actually, it's more than the Babylonian Empire, it's the whole entire world at this point, but they reign over the Babylonian Empire, correct? Correct. So we have Nebuchadnezzar, right? He dies, and who takes his place? Belshazzar takes his place. Now you have another king, not of the Babylonians, remember they were the Medo-Persians, they come and conquer the Babylonians, right? And his name is what? Darius is now king. So okay, I got that. Now you go to chapter 7. Look what chapter 7 says. Everybody there yet? That very first verse says, Now in the first year of who? Belshazzar, king of what? Babylonians. Wait a minute. Wasn't it Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, and then Darius became king? Now you said, Belshazzar is king. You're going backwards. Something's not quite correct here. You go on from there. Chapter 8 says, in the first year of King Belshazzar, we got that. He's a king. In today's lesson, it's in the first year of Darius. A lesson for today. See how the writer's going back and forth? It's not in a chronological order. And to add a little bit more confusion to this, this man... Darius, okay, today's lesson is the same man you saw as Darius back in chapter uh, number six. It's the same person. He's a king of the, of the Meds, of the Middle Persians. But there was another king of Persia called Darius the Great. He was called Darius the First. And some folks say, wait a minute, how is the king of the Persians, Darius the First, when you already had Darius of the Meds, the Middle Persians? I can't comment totally on if this is accurate or not because I had never found enough information but you had two Dariuses but they weren't together one was of the Meds and one was of the Persians some say why they called the other one Darius the Great who came along later uh, who was Xerxes father and all that they pronounced their names different some would say this Darius we're speaking of they called Darius the other king that came along later of the Persian Empire who ruled was Darius They'll spell the same, but they say that name different. That's why they say, how can he be the first and one came before him? Like, no, that's Darius. I'm Darius. But I'm not 100% sure on that. Now, the reason why I gave you all the information, you want to know why? It's my job. It's my mandate to give you the most accurate information that I can. It may seem like something small, but always later you'll find, guess what? It plays an important role in knowing these small details. So we see in the book of Daniel, things not really placed in a chronological order as they should be, but we have an understanding of where the lesson is going. Now, during the intercessory prayer, our lesson starts in verse 4 of chapter 9, but we have to start at the first verse to get the setting for where it is that we're going. 
Because in verse 4, it says, and I prayed. Well, we got to see, which means, and you prayed. Something came before this. What led to all this? What starts off, it says, Daniel 9, the first verse, in the first year of Darius, or some might say Darius, the son of Asuras, of the seeds of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Who are the Chaldeans? We, we said he was king. Hmm? Right. He is the king of the Babylonian Empire. And some say, wait a minute. It says he's the king of the Chaldeans. Remember I said something we consider small details, but they're always important. Earlier we learned that the Babylonians originally were called the Chaldeans, or some say Chaldeans, okay, located in what we would call today Iran. You will find that they had a capital city known as Babylon, and people identified more with the capital city than they did with that, that title of their, of their people. So as time went on, they somewhat lost the name of being called the Chaldeans, and they called them by their capital city, the Babylonians. Like I said before, it's like we're here today. We'll talk to people from some other state or whatever. They say, where are you from? Very few of you say, I'm from Ashland. You're in another state. They go, what is Ashland? You always say, I'm from Richmond. And they automatically know what you're speaking of. Similar thing that went on here. So they're now known as the Chaldeans originally, but now we know them as the Babylonians. So when you read these books, say, this one was king of Babylon. This king was king of Chaldeans. It's the same thing. But it's good to know those small details because you could be lost in the confusion that's about. But you will find now that this was the first year of this particular king. It says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, he said, understood by the books the number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. What Daniel talks about now, he talks about the books of a man by the name of Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was hundreds of years before this particular time, okay? Jeremiah was a prophet. And to go back, what is a prophet? Now, when we discuss this heavy every single week. What is a prophet? The one who brings forth the future revelations of God that have yet to come about, that have yet to transpire. Jeremiah was hundreds of years before this. Now, Daniel talks about he says, I understood by the books of the number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, the prophet. What he speaks of now, he talks about some books of Jeremiah. But really what he speaks of is, is not books. We know in the Bible that once again, how many books? 66. How many do we attribute, do you think, of to Jeremiah? Most say One. You'll find that typically uh, some books are anonymous to a certain degree, and they are speculation who wrote them. Most people give Jeremiah two books, the book of Jeremiah and the book known as Ecclesiastes, because he was called the, the wailing prophet, the one who cried over the situation that Jerusalem was in. So he wrote the book of, um, wait a minute, what do you write Ecclesiastes? Hold on, let me think about that. I might check myself on that. He might have wrote Ecclesiastes, but he wrote more than one book. But what they're speaking of here is not books that we look at it. Because Jeremiah, the book he's speaking of, is just one book. But what's the reason why they would call them books if you only wrote one book? The reason is they talk about the scriptures. Do you remember, a book is page after page after page after page. It's an epistle, which is a Latin word for basically means letter. So they would break these letters down and say, this is a book, this is a book, but really it's just a series of letters. Now, we put them all into one book and put chapters and verses on them. But what he speaks of is, I found now where Jeremiah has said something. And what did Jeremiah say? If you wanted to follow along briefly, I'm not going too heavy in detail. In the writings of Jeremiah 25, this is something that Jeremiah has said, that Daniel said, now I understood what he was talking about in this particular scripture. In Jeremiah 25, at verse 11, like I said, we're not going to go into this too heavy, but it says, and this whole land shall be a desolation, talking about the nation of Israel, and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. How many years he says here? 70 years. Y'all see that? 70 years, he said, you're going to serve 
Mind you, this man said this how many years earlier? Hundreds of years before this even happened, he said, this is what's going to happen. You shall serve them, he said, 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity in the land of the Chaldeans and will make it a perpetual desolation. You read on through the scriptures later on, know what it talks about? There shall come a king by the name of Darius who shall set you free. It followed to the letter, even though he said it hundreds of years earlier. Now, Daniel has found, you could say, the book and these writings that where he has said these words when he says, uh, whoops, let me go back to that, where he says in his scriptures, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years where the river Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. You see, a prophecy had come to, to pass. Now, some have said, he has said these things. Why didn't the people know about it? Why did he have to look at a book or read the scriptures and know about it when he said he would go into captivity 70 years? Don't they remember what the prophet had said? Had not they passed that on? Is it easy to forget something like that? Not everybody one time. It's easy to forget God said you're going to go into desolation for 70 years. Remember, who told them this? The prophet. Didn't they always believe what the prophet would say? But you'll find now nobody remembers anything what the prophet had said. Daniel has to find it. Well, let me, let me test y'all memory here. All right. Everybody, I, I got a question for you. Except Lonzo. Don't Lonzo, don't you say a word? Because I know you know it. Now, memory is good, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you, Sandra. What I'm getting at is how quickly we can forget things. Some would say, how can they forget what that prophet said that this was going to happen to them hundreds of years before and they believe the word of the prophet? Well, let me test you guys right quick. Helen ready. She got a hand on her hip and everything over here. She ready. Last week, we had a guest minister. What was the minister's name? His name was Lewis. Okay, some of y'all got that. That was good. That you know who brought forth the word. But guess what? The power is not an individual. The power is in what? In the word. Where did, where did he come from? Where did he preach from? Because Jeremiah is not important. It's what Jeremiah said that was important. What did he preach about? Uh-oh. I got to make that bet again. I took y'all to lunch this evening. What do you preach about? Help him, Pastor. No, don't say a word. Don't say a word. What do you preach about? All right. Well, let's get by what he preached about, okay? Don't, don't worry what he preached about or where he even came from. What was the title of his message? Okay, there you go. Y'all get the point now? Some get it. Some remember it, some don't. This is something that was prophesied hundreds of years before this. Nobody seems to know anything about it, but Daniel said, oh, I found it, and I understood by the books the number of years where the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet. So this is what he was talking about, that they would go into captivity, and it shows us, guess what? All the prophets of God always come to pass to the letter, to the point they even gave their names that just came to pass. But as he goes forth, it says, um, come to me, he says in verse 3, And I will set my face unto the Lord God, and to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. So now he has to go to God and pray, right? But how does he go to God in prayer? Explain why, or shall we say, not what he, what he looked like, but why does he go this way? He has to pray to God. He says, I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. I talk about the small things. Reverend Jackson said, take notes, not naps. You can get this if you go along. You had something, Sandra? Mm -hmm. Yep, he understood the prophecy. Mm -hmm. Oh, there we go. He understood the prophecy, right? He also understands the condition of the people and where they are at. That they are totally in the wrong 
that consequence that had come before them. So they had to pray to God, but I can't just go to God any kind of way. I got to come the right way, humble. So what he does now, he prepares himself. He put on, you say, tattered clothing. He sits in the ashes. In other words, I'm humble. I'm beaten down. I'm coming to God proper way in most respect. Because you can't just come to him any kind of way. I know people that don't want just anybody to pray for him. You know anybody like that? You got to pray the right way. I told you before, one of my uncles was going through a health um, issue some years ago. He's doing fine today. But I never forget he called me up. He said, I'm calling certain people in the family. He says, guess what? But he said to pray for me. He said, I haven't told everybody because I want prayer warriors praying for me. But he explained himself, but he was basically saying you have to come to God in the right way. You don't, don't come to him any kind of way. Here, Daniel comes now in the right way. It's kind of like when people pray, y'all might go to dinner today. If you go to a restaurant for dinner, because I hope it's not around, around your table you see this, watch who prays over their meal. Or does anybody pray over their meal? I've seen some pray over the meal, Lonzo. I think they're eating because they go, <laughs> like, did they pray or were they eating? But they said it so quick, almost as if they didn't want somebody to see them praying. I remember one time at work, had to go out of town, and we met with this group, and it was dinner time. The meal came, and guess, you know what I did, right? I said, I pray because I don't know what's going on in that kitchen back there. But I did my prayer, but I didn't ask Everybody at the table said, never go have prayer. Because folks you're with, don't everybody know you're God. Not everybody is of God. So if you're going to pray, I get it. But I prayed. One of the ladies there, when I finished, said, oh, I didn't know you was praying. If I know how to pray with you. i like, I hope you pray when I'm not around for your meal. But the point is, don't everybody come in the right way. Here, Daniel comes in the right way, humble as he can, because he's giving what kind of prayer? He's giving that intercessory prayer. He's interceding on the behalf of Israel. This is why we couldn't just jump right into this lesson. You had to go back and understand the setup he has here. And this is why he says in our very first verse, now even with the first verse, you understand a lot about this lesson already and why he's praying. He's understanding the situation that they are in, why they're there. Remember, they're in 70 years of captivity, not because they were some good people. They were going through a lot. And Daniel realized now that, guess what? The time is almost up. For them to go back to Jerusalem. Remember the time frame we gave? Who was king? Who was the first king? Nebuchadnezzar. He died. Who took his place? His third Belshazzar. Belshazzar was defeated by the Medo Persians. Another king by the name of what? Darius. When you do the math with all these, which we have time to go into, the 70 years is almost over. They're about to now be set free. But they just can't go back being the people that they once were. Daniel understands this. Daniel now said, We got to pray about this thing. This way he started, he says, and I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession. Daniel starts out at first making this thing personal, doesn't he? He said, who prayed? I prayed to who? My. Before we get to God, he says, my God. Daniel, when he came to prayer, he was like some people at the dinner table. They was ashamed to pray in public. Daniel said, this is my God, and I prayed. Because keep in mind, I think the next chapter, this one, Daniel gets into some, into some trouble for praying openly. Nobody wants to pray to any other God, but Nebuchadnezzar and so on. He's in the window, the window wide open, landing, and he's praying. He said, he didn't care who saw him. So now he makes this public confession. He said, I prayed unto the Lord. He says, my God. He openly accepts God here. Let him know this is God. He says, I made my confession. In other words, he made his own confession first. He understand who he is, what he is, and where he is at. He didn't say, I made your confession, but he made his own. Because when you give confession, basically you're giving, you're giving basically testimony. When you're giving testimony, you're giving witness. And to give witness basically means you're speaking factually what you know to be true. So he gives now true confession to the Lord of his God. And he says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God. They start off by saying, great. What does great do to anything if you apply it to it? It makes it, it builds you up, it does what? Come on, Jim. It makes me, you said it makes you bigger, the first thing you said. In other words, it elevates it. It's kind of like saying, you know, so-and-so is a good speaker. I get it. 
But this one here, that's a great speaker. That elevated. He said, so-and-so, um, Rose, you're fine, has some friends that can cook. Oh, but Rose, she's a great cook. See, I'm getting that. It took it now to a whole nother level. He didn't say it like some would say, they are God and these pagan gods. He said, the great God. He's elevated God to a whole different level, unlike all of those that are around him. Where folks get lost said when he says, and a dreadful God. What do you think that means? Dread. You're right with the awesome, because that's what it means. It means awesome. Because remember, the language ain't the same we had it, uh, as today. But oftentimes people look at it as dreadful. Like this, and what does dread mean? The loathe, you're afraid of, you don't want to deal with. It doesn't mean that. It's just saying if people say, how can you serve a God? He says you have to fear him. So that word fear doesn't mean that. It means worship, exalt, uplift, magnify. It's a word of Hebrew called yira. It's a whole different word, but you have to understand and study those words. But I always add this in. But well, sometimes, guess what? Remember, elders will tell you, sometimes you can have the fear of God put in you. Sometimes you need to be afraid to get yourself straight. It's just like you guys coming up. None of y'all came up in the age of timeout. Not, not one of you came up in that age of timeout. You know, you might have got knocked out, but you were, it, wasn't no, it, wasn't no, it wasn't no time I was involved. But all the time, they had to put that fear into you. You remember that? I can remember we would, well, I, let me give my confession. I remember I would mess up. You know what they would say? Oh, you wait till your grandfather come home. Then they said, oh, you wait till your mama come home. You wait till Uncle Purcell come home. You wait till Uncle Leon come home. I said, wait a minute now. I got five brothers here, and y'all need to spread this thing out. You know, how many beatings a person have to take? But you know what that did? It put fear into you. And the fear was, for me, the greatest thing was not to actual beating, but the waiting. They said, you sit right here. I'm going, I could have been beaten three hours ago, and this thing been behind me. But now you have to wait for it. So it put that dread, it put that fear into you. You, know, you could say it's to a point that it turned into more of respect. But with God, he doesn't want us to be afraid of him. But sometimes you have to have that fear of God placed upon you. But he talks about this great and awesome God that he served. He says, a great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and them that keep his commandments. So he talks about how good God is, how God keeps his covenant and has mercy to them that what? Love him and keep his commandments. But you understand here, though, what is a covenant? I got, I got agreement. What else would you call a covenant? It's a contract, contract works. Anything else? All these adjectives are correct, but I'm going to do like that great thing. I'm, I'm going to add to it and build upon it. It's an agreement. It is a contract. And yet, when I look at a contract, we know it's agreement, right? Binding agreement, right? Unless it's secular. Because, see, a secular agreement is not a binding agreement. A secular agreement or a contract, you know what it is? It's a negotiated agreement of the parties to come to a common resolution. Got that? It is a negotiated agreement between the parties to come to a common resolution. In other words, we're going to negotiate. You know, you look at sports, for example. They have contracts, don't they? They would say, I'm going to play for you, but I want so much up front. And they say, well, we're going to give you this. They say, well, I want this much for my jersey and so much percentage of that. And so, and the list goes on and on. They go back and forth. They bicker back and forth. Then it's, guess what? It's signed. It's notarized. And it's supposed to be binding. But the thing about a contract, a secular contract, is at any given time, any one of those individuals can contest it and break it. At any given, and it's broken. You know, you get you had one <coughs> that was just about to happen the other day. Y'all see the um, those who work on the, the ports was going on strike, or they, they actually went on strike for a moment, which could have been some hard times coming up. Hard times coming up. You know, they wanted some things. You know, and they already put some things out there. The three main things they wanted was, one, automation, they said, could hurt them. And these robots and machines doing all the work. The next thing they wanted, could possibly put them out of business, too, if you're not careful. They said they want a 50% increase in pay. And my brother-in-law said, me, too. And he don't even work there. Then they also said for their uh, retirement and all, they want the companies now to contribute three times as much as they once put in. Just been put off to January. But that could end up being, guess what? Have an arbitrator come in and they're going to be negotiating back and forth. Then they're going to sign it. And they got a signed contract. Three years later, they may be fighting again and say, well, we want to break this contract. But here's the difference between a covenant. A covenant is not a negotiated agreement between the common parties. Because how can you out-negotiate God? God said, I got all this here for you. 
If you agree to it, follow my ways, it's yours. And you go, well, God, I get what you're saying. I know you got you on everything, but how about we do this? What do you have to offer? But the biggest thing about it is this. A covenant cannot be broken but by one party. And who is that? Mm -mm. Got you on that one. God never breaks a covenant. Never breaks a covenant. You break the covenant. Because you'll see many times God said, this is what I have you. It's called a conditional covenant. God said, if you follow my ways and do these, this is what I have for you. But the minute they mess up, God said, it's still there for you once you change your ways. You get the point? He never broke it. You broke it, but God said, it's still here for you. Everything I have is still right here for you. I will not take it away. But at this time, you will not have it because you have not followed my ways. But once you change, guess what? You have it back. But did God break his covenant? No, because he told you from the very start, this is all yours if you do this and this and that. It will always be here. And God has granted it, and then man messes up. God said, it's still there for you. Just repent, and guess what? It's given back. Truthfully, in your heart, you repent, and it's given. So God never breaks a covenant. So this is what it meant when it said God deals with, um, it talks about this covenant here, where it says, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him, to them that keep his commandment. He always keeps that covenant. But as we go on, it says, verse 5, we have sinned and have committed iniquity and have done wickedly, and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. He recognized there's a problem with the people, right? They're going back to Jerusalem in a short order of time, but they need prayer because they have done the wrong things. They have basically sinned is what he's saying. And most of the verses after this, you'll find, you know, we won't cover nowhere near this. It's repeating itself but saying it in a different way. But here's a question I have for you. Primarily, there are two types of sins. Anybody know what they are? And don't say bad and badder. You know, it's more than that. There's two types of sin. And give me them give you a hint too for later on. And Reverend Jack said, What? Take notes, not naps. Because it may come up again. What are the two pri primarily types of sin? Wanna take a shot at it? Oh, I'm not getting into that conversation, Gigi. She says, some sin is good. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> a good sin or a bad sin. No, what you have is, you have two. Hmm? Oh, actually, Helen, you explained it, and you are all right. The only thing you didn't put on that was the title of the sin, but you got it exactly right. I'm going to cover it in a second. Digging on Jones. Sin is the Holy Spirit. But this is what you primarily have, folks. In the hierarchy of sin, you primarily have two types of sin. A sin of omission and a sin of commission. Those are the two primary types. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, a sin of commission is you're guilty of what it is you've done. A sin of omission, guess what, Helen? You're guilty of what it is you didn't do. And that's the one that throws people. They say, wait a minute, how am I guilty of something that I didn't do? I didn't do it. Oh, yeah, I'm guilty of it? But see, here's what they mean by that. A sin of commission, just think of commit. You've committed the sin. You know, Miss, Miss Susie up here got, a, got a, a tool shed, and she got a nice zero-turn lawnmower in it. And Jimmy, I want that lawnmower. I'm going to break into her shed and steal her lawnmower. I willfully committed a sin. That's called a sin of commission, right? Now I broke into it, Jimmy, right? Oh, uh, no, I did it. Sin of commission, I did it, right? I am guilty of a sin of commission because I committed it. Now, here's the thing, guys. Jimmy Taylor back here, he knew I was going to do it. I told him I was going to do it. He knew all about it. He knew it was wrong that I shouldn't break Miss Susie's shed and steal her lawnmower. Jimmy, you didn't do nothing about it. In God's eyes, you committed sin. You're just guilty because you could have corrected it. And you willfully chose to step back. So sometimes, folks, even the thing we said we didn't do, Oh, you're still guilty of it because you knew you could have did something about it, but yet you chose not to. And now the sin has been committed. Those are two primary causes there. But the thing of it is, you have to recognize you have sinned. And you find here, Daniel didn't say what in verse 5, I have sinned, does he? What does he say? We. He puts himself in the collective with all of them. He said, we all have sinned. We all have messed up. 
And he even goes through the list that we committed iniquity, we have done wickedly, we have rebelled, even by departing from their precepts and their judgment. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which speak in thy name to our kings, our prince, our father, and to all the people of the land. What he's saying is, guess what? I have no excuse. If we had time, and I can show you the book of Isaiah, when God sent Isaiah to preach to the people, Isaiah said these words, how long should I preach to them? And God said, until they be carried away into desolation. So his remarks was something like this. Well, why am I going to preach to people that are going to captivity anyway? He said, therefore, they will have what? No excuse. They already know. So they can't say, well, I didn't know I was doing wrong. Yes, you did, because the prophets of old talked to you. Daniel basically brings this back up by saying, the prophets came, and who did they talk to? He said, they spake to the name to our kings, our prince, our fathers. And then he says, and to some of the people of the land. Y'all didn't catch that, did you? He said, they're going to know all the people of land. So everybody knew this. Nobody had an excuse to say, well, I didn't know. But the word went forth. But the thing about a prophet is, most of the time the prophet came, was his message good or bad? I got a usually bad. Anybody else? Take a shot here. You know, I like to twist things up, get you thinking. The prophet message, Lonzo said they were both. He took the easy way out. See that? <laughs> he took the easy way out. He said both. Usually, you will find that the message that came from God to the people was a message of good. Now, why was it good? When you talk about doom, gloom, destruction, you're going to go into captivity and all these things. Typically, it was a message of good because God told them, if you change your ways, these things will not happen to you. But if you don't, you're going away, you're doing this, doing this, doing that. So basically, he gave you a way out. He was like, no, if you don't turn around, guess what? Something's going to happen. You know, it's like I used to use Sondra in here. It's kind of like you telling a student, Dr. Ray, you, you're in the education field. You tell a student, boy, if you don't study this test, you're going to fail. Next day, you didn't do your homework, you're going to fail. Miss a couple days in school, you're going to fail, you're going to tighten up. They're going to say, every time Dr. Ray come in, y'all, she got bad news. <laughs> All Dr. Ray gave them was good news. You're trying to guide them in the right direction, but they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to receive it. But then when they look back and read it, guess what? Has the message changed? It's the same message we before, but now like Daniel, oh, now I understand what was going on. It's just like when they tell you, look, you don't do what you're supposed to do, boy, you get bust out the head, and then they bust you side your head, you go, oh, now I understand. And that's what they have here. God has struck them down, and guess what? Now they say, we understand, and we want to come back. It kind of goes back to like the moment the judges, they would follow God. The judge died, then you go out doing bad again. They bring another judge, they do good. They up and down, up and down. And that's what we have here now. And Daniel sees this. And Daniel now wants to mix that intercessory prayer on his behalf and for his people. And this is why he says in verse 7, O Lord, righteousness belongeth to thee, but unto us confusion of faces, as at this day the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to all Israel that are near and that are far off through all the countries whither thou hast driven them, because of their trespass, they have trespassed against thee. O Lord, to us belongeth confusion of face. We have to kind of close it out near here. What he speaks of now is confusion of face is basically saying this, we are ashamed of what it is that we have done. All of us from those that are near and those that are far. What you mean by those that are near and far is some of them are in Babylon at this time. But remember, the Assyrians attacked the kingdom of a nation of Israel earlier. And it took them to captivity and scattered them all over the place. It's just the people of Judah are the only ones located primarily in that of the Babylonian territory. But he recognizes all of God's people have done these things because they're calling for all of them to come back home at a later time. But at this point in time, he recognizes, he says, we have confusion of faces. It doesn't mean they're confused. It means they're ashamed of the action and what they've done. And like I said about problem solving, there's three primary steps to, to solve the problem. Anybody know what those three steps are? The first one, recognize you got a problem. Because if you don't recognize you got a problem, you're not going to do anything about it. The second step is then to do a perspective. Otherwise, you look back. How did I get here in the first place? Because if you don't know your history, guess what? You're destined to repeat it. So now you look back, go, okay, I got a problem. I recognize I have a problem. And now I look at this thing. I see how I got here in the first place. Hopefully, it won't happen again. Then the third one is you put them both together. And the next thing is what you're going to do. You have to make a decision. You're going to stay where you're at or you're going to move on. 
plain and simple. And here you'll find that they see their situation, they see they're in sin. Our only solution is, guess what? They take it to the Father. At this point in our writing, we don't have one man who has enough sense, guess what, to pray for everybody else, Wallace, who didn't have enough sense to pray for themselves. Because the people weren't doing this. So Daniel said, guess what? I'm going to make an intercessory prayer on my behalf, but especially for this, your people, for all they have done. Verse 8 says, O Lord, to us belongs the confusion of faith, to our kings, to our prince, to our fathers, because I have sinned against thee. Oh, he said, we again. See how you put everybody in the same category? He said, we have sinned again. And I'm just going to read through these and we're going to close this thing out. He said, to the Lord our God belong mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. He understands now if they come back, God is full of grace and mercy. He said, neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his ways, which he set before us by his servants of prophets. Remember the first thing he started off by saying, I give forth my confession. He's confessing all these things. He said, yes, all Israel have transgressed, transgressed, uh, transgressed our law, even by departing that they might not obey the voice. In other words, some of them just left. You know, it's like, I quit teaching this in the church. They don't hear what has to be said in the church. What do they do? They leave. They upset by something somebody said in church. Guess what? They leave. And that's what it speaks of here. He said, yes, all Israel transgressed by the law, even by departing that they might not obey the voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us and the oath that is written in the law of Moses, servant God, because we have sinned against him. And he that has confirmed his words, which he spake against us and against our judges that judge us by bringing upon us a great evil for under the whole heaven have not been done as have been done upon Israel. Now, God does not bring in any evil. OK, if you look at that word they use, when you look at evil, evil basically means something that's bad in their tongue and also brings forth punishment. See, when God would punish them, they look at punishment as being bad. Don't, that, don't we look at it that way? Your mom beat you. Well, she sure wasn't bad to me today. She's being mean to me. No, it's not nothing evil she has done. It's basically bringing punishment upon you, and that is what they recognize here. But as it goes out, it says, verse 13, As it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God, that we might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. It's all about the understanding. Therefore, had the Lord washed upon the evil and brought it upon us, for the Lord our God is righteous in all his works which he doeth, for we obey not his voice. What this deals with now is they recognize why this stuff happened to us? Because we didn't walk the way we were supposed to walk. And we can't say God is wrong. Now we say God is righteous for what it is he has done unto us because we were the one that we're in the wrong. But guess what? The prayer doesn't end there. There's some other things that said, but that's at a later time. But next week, we're dealing with chapter 10, which deals with God strengthens Daniel. And we all are in need of strength at times, aren't we? Even though we may think we're Superman, Superwoman, at some time and point, all of us need to be strengthened up. So next week we're coming to Jan Daniel, the 10th chapter, verses 10 through 19. I don't need to tell you what you need to do as far as all of your studies and how to study that. Read some things before it. Read some things after it. Because many things we will talk about will not be part of this printed text, but it will be part of the lesson itself. So once again, thank you guys for taking part in this and hope we didn't confuse you with, with all the kings and the dates and all but those small points you'll find are very important to understand who you are dealing with and what was going on at that particular time so with those words being said it's time for them to stand to our feet as we have a closing word of prayer to bring us into the worship service so shall we pray fathers once again just closing hour of our sunday school session we thank you dear lord truly for all those that came to hear your word and to dialogue to study to understand it our prayer and desire coming in was that we will leave here with more than what it is we came with. And that what we take from this lesson, dear Lord, we not only use it for our benefit, but we will also share it yet with others. And now, dear Lord, as this session is about to end, and we're about to move into the worship experience, we ask that your holy presence will still preside in this building. That you would, dear Lord, use our past in the way you see fit. That may make preaching easy and the words may go forth. Bless those that have come here today, dear Lord, and those that still may even be on their way. For it's in Jesus' name we give this prayer. Amen.